Okay, um, what I'm going to talk about is exploration, mostly Branfield's exploration and mostly gold. I'm going to start off talking about Western Australia and some of the controversies here in Western Australia, but those are transportable around the, goal, around the world and have particular significance to the situation in Southern Africa. Um, let me start with a pretty typical scene in Western Australia during exploration. Here you see with the water a 1980s open cut. It probably went down 60 metres, it's filled up with water since then. And then 20 to 30 years later, you see over here and over here, drill rigs drilling beneath that to identify more gold. Um, and that rig is, is not a problem with your eyes, it is at 45 degrees, and the whole purpose was to get an intersection at the, the base of, of this, this filled in pit. Now this Brownfields exploration is something that um, all companies do. I sat on the board um, for many years of a company that was doing this project here, and w we never ever discussed whether we were doing the right thing, whether we should be doing Brownfields exploration like this. But at the same time, consultants, academics, um, and some politicians were saying that we've got all this wrong and we should be doing some different Greenfields exploration. This came together with Neil Phillips when Neil showed me a whole series of data that seemed to back up what we were doing and we subsequently had an additional set of data from the Geological Survey of Western Australia. So I need to acknowledge both of those. So the talk is structured with a background to gold mining in Western Australia. Then the controversy about production and exploration. And finally, we'll have a look at implications for Southern Africa. The photograph here on the right is about 10 years old. Um, this is the um, super pit at Kalgoorlie. This buttress on the Golden Mile Fault has now been mined out and all this foreground is now a big hole in the ground. Um, and, and this is a, a big gold mine. Just in case there's some North Americans listening, we have to have our, our trigger warnings. I do warn you that the talk will end with the longest word in the English language. And then when it comes to questions, we will have questions. But the questions are turned around because I'm going to ask you to tell me the closest Greenfields discovery to Johannesburg since the 1980s. So if it's gold, something more than two million ounces, or if it's some other commodity, more than three billion US dollars of, con of contained metal. So the closest Greenfields discovery to Johannesburg. So moving on, this is the, the, the graph that motivated um, a series of papers which you can see here. Essentially in the orange, and we just, just look at the orange at the moment, you can see how Australia's gold production fell to being pretty trivial from 1920 until the mid-1980s. And then in the, in the late 1980s, soared and has been maintained at about 250 to 300 tonnes per annum since then. The only other country in the world that has a similar pattern to that is the United States of America, or um, more simply phrased, Nevada. Countries like Canada, that looked as if they were going to achieve it, um, failed to do so and, and have been a, a, a regular sort of disappointment. Some countries like South Africa have gone the other way, um, but most other countries have just maintained that have not graphed here a pretty level um, field. There's one country that um, would claim to have production higher than Australia. Um, it's not been graphed here simply because their claims are, they, they lack an ability to verify those results. 
So I've stuck to gold production, which can be verified, as opposed to gold production that is requested by the political leaders of the country. Of the papers, the paper by Neil Phillips at Eshoes and myself here deals with the production and how exploration, we believe, is critical to successful production. The middle paper here by Neil um, and David looking at the hard rock, um, Ray Smith, Charles Button, Ra uh, Ravi Anand looking at regolith, and Ed Eshoes providing some of the corporate material in there, looked at the science that drove the exploration that raised Australia from here to here to being the number one producer of gold these days. And the final paper, which was the one that I um, co-authored with Neil Phillips, where we looked at Brownfield's gold exploration and were really quite controversial in some of the things we say that differ to what a lot of um, consultants, academics and government are saying about the role of industry. So the next slide here is Bloody Australia. And it goes on forever and ever and ever. To give you a little bit of detail, this is a high of laterite. That fall off just there is only about 20 metres. And that is a bush, not a tree. And it continues like that forever. Flat, pretty boring. To emphasise, there's a hill over here. That is an outlier of middle Proterozoic sandstones with an unconformity just at the base there. In other words, since the middle Proterozoic to today, the Earth's surface has been within about 100 metres of where it is now. And if you drill a hole out here, you will go through about 100 metres of saprolite or of clays and saprolite before you hit anything that is solid. So should we be exploring the brown fields as per the first slide, or should we be out here in the green fields looking for new deposits? Now, despite the results of this talk, I do emphasize that um, green fields exploration does happen. I have been involved in it. And we did actually find a deposit just in there a while ago. So let's just go straight on to some basics about Australia's economy to show you just how important this is and why these sorts of things might not just be debated by geological societies, but are actually mentioned in the federal parliament. This is the nation's exports. And apart from the quantum, you would say that we are a developing nation. This is metals and energy, uranium, petroleum, coal. The reason why gold is not included in that is because some of the gold is a product of refining for neighboring countries. Manufacturing includes aluminium, copper and zinc smelting as major industries. Services includes mining services and also those um, consequent things like stockbroking. So in fact, about 60% of the economy of the country is dependent on geologists finding metal for people to mine. Um, and probably this year, 70% of the country will be dependent on that because obviously the education and tourism which have fallen to services, have fallen off. But this is the map of sort of Australia's geology that you're probably mostly used to. And we're talking about Western Australia here. Now, Western Australia, which you think of as just a third of Australia, this is the land area of South Africa, Namibia and Botswana combined. And it has the population equivalent to the population of Namibia only. So we do social isolation rather than social distancing. You may have always thought of Australia as being a powerhouse for mining, but um, despite over a thousand 
old gold mines in this area. In, by the 1920s, most of those had shut. And in 1950, there were only four mines of any sort in the state of Western Australia. It is the sort of thing that you may have described as mature. Of those mines, which are known as a blue asbestos mine that we don't mention, Collie is a coal mine that still, still operates, and Norseman and Kalgoorlie gold mines. At that particular stage, there was no other mining in the state. Now, since then, Argyle Diamonds, Savannah Nickel, Kajabat and Admiral Bay um, MVTs, all the iron ores through here, um, lithium at Pilgangura, um, manganese at Woody Woody, nickel, gold, lithium, bauxite have all been found in the state. If we take where Western Australia was in 1950 or 1948 here and then grow it by inflation, that would be our economy today. But this is our economy and you can see it's this massive import of petroleum, mostly gas and minerals, mostly iron ore, but also gold, lithium, bauxite, um, nickel. So Australia's production looks like this. The Western Australian contribution is most of it. This is gold. And the 2020 um, production expectation is just quoted here. Um, that was in the newspaper just earlier this morning. Um, and we'll be producing about 320 tonnes of gold. Um, I'm one of the people who prefers ounces, but uh, a lot of the data is quoted in tonnes. 100 tonnes is about 3 million ounces. So what is it that enabled us and only one other jurisdiction, Nevada, to come up here and then maintain production so, so well? Obviously, most of the gold is here, but there's some gold at Cali, which I will mention. And there's also the import of Cadia and Olympic Dam both of which are copper gold deposits, and they will get mentioned. So the first of those papers um, that I mentioned deals with, well, why did this happen? And if you talk to people, people will say, oh, it's the, it was a gold price, or it was mining equipment, or it was processing methods, in particular carbon in pulp. But the whole thing about all of those sorts of things that people say was that they were available across the globe. Everybody enjoyed the same gold price. Everybody could within six or 12 months access mining equipment, processing methods. There was nothing there that says why you were successful in a terrain that previously had got a trivially small mining industry to become a world leader. And the, that particular paper argues that the thing that makes the difference was exploration success. And I have to sort of cut in at this stage because there's a number of academic journals which sort of present exploration as, as the latest sort of implication based on an isotope. By exploration, I mean drilling holes Obviously, the design of that hole requires good science, but we mean drilling holes and testing the results. And in particular, drilling holes that will make or break a project. And we believe that that is the difference to what we achieved to many other places. The second paper in that list, the one with the um, long, long list of, of relatively famous people, highlighted the six pieces of science that were behind that successful exploration. One, the structural control on gold. So as soon as you've got a gold intersection, 
you're working on the structure to understand the shape of your body, to find more and to evaluate it. That certain rocks are much more likely to host um, gold, that's rheology and chemistry, but in particular, the rocks with elevated iron. And we can use the alteration to assess how big the system is, and also to provide gradients into the ore. In Western Australia, we had to understand the regolith. We had to understand this. So we had to understand the landforms to know what we were exploring on and to vary the exploration with those um, Cretaceous to, to um, Cainozoic landforms. We had to understand the way that gold disperses in the regolith and low temperature weathering and movement of gold and associated elements. And also we had to know what to sample. So you go out here, sampling clays is not particularly useful. We need to sample basaritic pizzolis, nodules, jury crust, calcrete. And if we're going to drill it, wrap drilling on, on a grid over the whole area. So I hope I've given you the impression that we are phenomenally successful, we're really pleased with ourselves, and we should be having a really big pat on the back. The ABC is the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Um, it, it's sometimes compared to the BBC, but that's rude on the BBC, which is a little bit more professional. But this is an article that the ABC ran only a year ago. Australia's gold industry on the edge of a production cliff as mines run out of gold. There is a very strong feeling amongst some quarters that we are in trouble and that there is some sort of crisis. Moving on, these quotes which I've carefully referenced, the crisis in mineral exploration as presented by the Boston Consulting Group. And that particular crisis is based on the work of Richard Shoddy, although I emphasise that Richard Shoddy, a mineral economist, tends to not have these dramatic phrases associated to him. Indeed, the, the, the strongest phrase I can get from Richard's documents is discovery rates declining and discovery costs are rising. Um, this is a, uh, a state government here saying industry must now focus on tier one discoveries. One of the things that I hope you'll take away from what I'm saying now is that industry does not have to focus on tier one discoveries. They happen after you've started mining. Another view is that we need more, what they call pre-competitive, I think it's a horrid word, but basically they mean academic and government science. And finally, the comment that we're in crisis, but the government appears to be unprepared to fund it. Of course, the government doesn't fund an industry that is so strong and doing so well. Whilst the previous set of quotes I've referenced and you can find the source, some of these I'm, I, I can't tell you where they've come from, but mostly grant applications by academics and government foraging for, for government dollars. The decreasing probability of memory... I need to go backwards. Backwards. The decreasing probability of mineral discovery together with increasing costs. Cost of sword, discovery is plummeted. It's too expensive. The Yilgarn is mature. We've found nothing since Tropicana. That's not true. Tropicana was the um, Anglo gold discovery, um, but since then Gruyere has been found. Companies need to make only big things. We can get rid of geologists and replace them with digital technologies, and we need a lot more government intervention. Whilst I'm not necessarily arguing that any of those are wrong, I do argue that most of them are inappropriate. This is a global graph taken from Richard Shoddy. 
And the graph for Western Australia or Australia would look much the same. And you see how everybody seemed to be that much better in the past and we are that much worse now. Richard, since we've started talking about this, puts in this caveat here where he talks about an artifact in how companies report discoveries. That could equally well be phrased about the way that the data are collected in that if you discovered a mine in 1995, like the Anglo Gold discovery of Sunrise, for instance, but you add resources to that here in 2020, those resources are recorded in this data collection method back at 1995, but the dollars go down in the present. So the whole method of collecting the data makes the past look that much better than the present. This is a slightly different graph, but it's the same thing in the blue here, the fall off in production. So the green and the orange are only from exploration success, and they show that falling off that production cliff being predicted by some of the economists for Western Australia and Australia. And those sorts of things are reproduced globally. At the same time, we have these graphs coming out from Geoscience Australia that show Australia's economic demonstrated resources. So each year, the previous level of resources that we had drops due to the gold that's been mined. And then we add the resources that have been added by exploration. Most countries would be happy if the line was flat. The country's line goes up and Western Australia's lines are going up. An economic demonstrated resources is used by the USGS and the Australian government. And essentially it's the combination of indicated and measured resources and all reserves. So here we see more gold being added than has been mined. A production cliff seems very unlikely. If we go to Western Australia, these dots are all the gold deposits in orange, the mines in the slightly lighter and larger prospects, occurrences and such like. I think you can see that there is very little prospect for Greenfield's exploration in the prospective ground. Griere is the most recent deposit. Tropicana looks to be off the Archean Yilgarn, but we now know that within the Proterozoic trend is a strip of Archean rock. Every two years, Keith Yates produces a book of the latest Greenfield finds. If we take his 1995 book and work our way through the deposits and look at how big they were when the mine just opened. So these mines were all opening in 1995 and what their endowment is now, we see that some have really gone nowhere like this chalice. But some like Bronzewing, 3.1 to 5 million ounces, Jundee, 1.3 to 8 million ounces, Sunrise, 1 million to 15 million ounces, Plutonic, 6 million to 10 million ounces, have grown substantially. In other words, this is all gold that has been added after the mine was found. And another list here, you could argue that some of these were Brownfield's discoveries when written up in 1995, and we go to what they are now. Calais, from 1 million to 16 million. Cadia, from 6 million to 44 million. Canal Nobel, from 4 million to 9 million. 
In other words, gold has been found after mining started and with probably only one cadia out of all those that I listed would you have called any of them world class. Some of them were quite small operations and they became world class during mining. The upside here is an average of 8.3 million ounces added to an average of 2 million ounces as a starter when the mine was opened. This is a graph of just taking the data from those sorts of books that Keith Yates produces and it looks at the steps in the addition of gold in these deposits. And the, uh, I'm not suggesting that the averages are statistically particularly important, but the general idea is that we add gold in about half to a million ounce lots at a time. And some people would argue that that matches quite simply with the, um, uh, with, with the fact that a $12 million budget is the sort of budget you get. And if you do all the back calculation on density of drilling to, to um, define an Archean or organic deposit, you'll end up with about half a million to a million ounces. These are the data from the Geological Survey of Western Australia. Years here, so this is 2018. These are kilograms and we have an annual production about like that. And some people look at this and they say, oh, that's our reserve, proven, probable and measured. That's not enough, our industry is in crisis. And they ignore the inferred and the indicated. But if we go back to say 2008 and we look at production, it tells us that if those are what the industry hung on, by about 2013, we should have fallen off that production cliff. And that's not the case because industry is systematically converting the inferred to indicated. And then when it's needed, three, four, five years before production, putting it into reserve. So there is absolutely no crisis, despite what you will be told um, by many, many people. So why is Brownfield's exploration so good? Why is it so successful? Well, one of the reasons it's driven by geologists on site and in the same habitat as the mining engineers. Secondly, drilling, particularly deep, um, cost-effective RC drilling, directional core drilling, and data collection technologies have, have, have boomed. We've now got effective structural geology, and that structural geology can be incorporated into modern databases, 3D color-coded rotational um, programs. This is just one image of the many things that you're aware of, which enable us to handle this data. So this is where those drill rigs were right at the beginning on the frontispiece and that moved from being a Branfield's exploration into a mine and this was the first blast on the reopening of that mine. What are the things that we need to do? I believe the industry understands this but I don't believe that the consultants, economists, politicians have understood it, which is, which is the drivers that yield the timing of resource upgrades and the conversion of resources to reserve. Secondly, we need to much better understand the links between access to capital, the reinvestment of production dollars um, and the conversion of modest 
tier two, tier three deposits into world-class deposits. And finally, how we might pick world-class deposits from the data when the mine opens as a small deposit or even during expiration. So the conclusions are that your next world-class tier one deposit will be under cover. It'll be under a cover of mining infrastructure. But there is a really, really important twist here. This is not anti Greenfields expiration. Indeed, it encourages Greenfields expiration. What is wrong is when a generation of people give the young generation the demand that they go out and find a tier one in the Greenfields. The past didn't do it. Send them out to find something modest. It needs to be big enough to open a mine. It needs to be big enough to buy your social license. But they do not need to go out and find great big things because they will grow once the mine is opened. So with all that criticism of mineral exploration, I do emphasize that we should stop the flocking now sinny hilly pillification of gold exploration. Thank you very much, Julian. That was a, an inspiring talk for us geologists who worry about these sorts of graphs. Um, can I open it to questions and comments? Absolutely. But the, the, uh, I'm asking the question. Name okay. the closest and, and, Greenfield's discovery to Johannesburg since the 1980s. I don't see any hands up yet. There's some in Namibia. I'm not sure I would count anything on the bits as a Greenfields project, but I'm not sure how others, others feel about that. Julian, we're not getting any responses from anybody okay. on this one. I, I've made my point. I think so. Um, um, what I would what emphasize is, is that Exploration is about these things. And if, if the South African industry has fallen off like this, people may argue sovereign risk. You may argue politics. You may argue depth of mines. You may argue labor laws. But they are as bad or more difficult in many countries. Um, really you will find that any fall off of that nature is accompanied by a lack of exploration. Um, just check your chats because people have put in um, Ochakoto, uh, Navachab and um, Kalgold. Fantastic. I'm for some reason, I can't see that side of things this time, although I did when I gave the previous Zoom talk. Zoom may have changed the software again. Uh, the, the chat room uh, from John Blaine, Waterberg PGE, from uh, Pete Siegfried, uh, Achikoto, from Stefan Kalbskoff, Kalgol, question mark, from Africa to everyone, Navachop uh, in Namibia. And Stuart Clegg uh, suggests Crypan for gold. Fantastic. So there's, there's so there are some. Carry on. Any other questions? We've also added Lesogo from the Bushveld. Um, Julian, for me, one of the first slides you showed was the, the gold production of uh, four key countries, Australia, South Africa, United States, and one other. Um, 
the the country you were referring to that you didn't include on there, I presume, was China. Is that correct? That that's correct. Um, the the president Xi Jinping um, said he wanted China to produce four hundred and fifty tons of gold per annum, and lo and behold, two years later, the bureaucrats had four hundred and fifty tons of gold per annum. It, it's it's just unverifiable. Perhaps China does produce that, and I'm certainly not saying that it does not. I am emphasizing that it's unverifiable. We don't even know if they have the plant infrastructure to process that much. And, and if they're producing 450, is that from Chinese gold mines or gold mines in China? So, so where, where's the input come from? That's a key point. And, and I mean, Rich Goldfarb gave a talk a couple of weeks ago. Um, he showed you some large mines in China, except that those weren't especially large. By, by our standards, they were not large mines and they, didn't, they don't look capable of, of, of that sort of level of production. So maybe China is doing it, um, in which case, um, great but um please 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 give us the breakdown so that we can verify the data are there any other questions or comments just unmute your mic and go ahead go for it there's a couple of chats, uh, Tati Greenstone Belt, East Botswana, and Dr. Uh, I John Sullivan. With the, I was involved with the Tati project um, in 2002, and yes, that must be about two, two million ounces. Yes. And Dr. John Sullivan notes that South Africa really fell off a cliff in 94. I don't think we'll explore that one very much further. Um, Unless there are last chance for comments or queries. Going once, uh, we've got one from Nolene. Um, Nolene? Hi, have I unmuted myself now? Yes. You have. Uh, Julian, thanks very much for that talk. Um, it is always nicer when you have people laughing at your jokes. So I'm going to explore getting some canned laughter for your next talk. <laughs> and people don't always recognize that they're a joke. <laughs> um, so maybe we'll just 